we do everything without the the use of anything artificial it does mean more manpower it does mean more labor but it's beautiful when you sit here and you watch the bees and the birds and 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 you just appreciate it and we're constantly experimenting with new things there's always something to do you never finish this is it's like i said before we're just custodians and and we can do our best and then hopefully someone will continue to do that But yeah, traditionally these kind of flatbeds were used for carrying, you know, so for, for work, yeah, carrying stuff. Carrying this conversation to, yeah, new uh, new places, I guess. So Laura, thanks for coming on the podcast. No problem. Is it is it your first podcast? It is actually, yeah. I've never there done a go. podcast before, no. Debut for you. Yeah, a new, a new thing being for on, me. You've been on the carriage before. But yeah. Um, <laughs> So yeah, new experiences. Nice. So uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me here. We've just you're welcome. We've taken the best part of a, an hour to walk around, and you've introduced me to lots of your plants and wildlife, and yeah. all the chickens and the hens. And got wet in the process. Yeah, we did, and now now it's dry. And we're, <laughs> in, and we're under shelter. Yeah, no, <laughs> we did it, did this bit the wrong way around, I think. <laughs> That's funny. Um, but yeah, so uh, why don't you tell us about you first of all perhaps how it came to be i'd like to do like a past present and future okay in terms of like how you came to be this farmer <laughs> that you are now um and what that and, and your experiences traveling and yeah and upbringing and stuff well, where did you where were you born first of all you, so born you in newcastle newcastle upon tyne yeah uh -huh. so um grown up about five minutes from the paddock where we're sitting now so yes. um the the my parents um built the house that they still live in which is where we grew up which is about a five minute drive from here that's actually next door to the paddock farm shop that we have so in the 80s my granddad my grandma and granddad had a textile soft furnishings business it was quite quite big at the time my granddad was kind of um one of the first to introduce certain textiles and stuff to the northeast and he had he'd been in the army he'd been in the remi the royal engineer um mechanical engineers sorry mm -hmm. um and he was really good at fixing things and tinkering with machines and sewing machines and stuff like that and he went on to work in factories um producing textiles on a large scale in the northeast um running uh, you know uh, i'm not sure how many but there was a lot of machinists you know that he would manage and yeah. then he went off on his own and um, and the business was called francis ellen roach that was my um, my great grandma's name so they managed to uh, buy the the building that the, that we still have now where the farm shop is i think it was 83 um and kind of took the business uh, on its own from there and then my dad and my uncle they joined and um and that was the family business for a long time and um, my grandma unfortunately had a large stroke and then over time um it was more well i suppose the way the world's gone in many ways but um sort of cheaper textiles imported ready-mades because this was like your bespoke fitting services and so dad and nev would um fit for lots of um footballers you know country hall estates it was that kind of high-end bespoke textiles um and they decided decided to dissolve that business and split the units split the main building into units which is now rented out to different businesses and that's where the paddock farm shop space so when the veg box scheme started we started in the back unit which we still use for the veg boxes which is the family unit um, and over time somebody moved out of one of the front shop facing units and we had the opportunity to start the shop so um that's kind of um yeah where i where i grew up and where the business is based and why it's still based there and and it's very much tied to um, the locality and and the kind of family connection it's a big part of of the paddock and um, the small holding dad mom and dad bought in 2002 we were always into horses dad had always had horses always kept chickens growing a bit of veg done that kind of thing so um he had the opportunity to buy this um and it was just six and a half acres there was nothing there was no no means water there's still no means power or anything but there was no means water no fencing nothing um, and it had been part of a, a larger farm of which the traditional old farmhouse still stands at the bottom and they own some of the land but this plot had come up so dad went ahead and bought this and um yeah then sort of 
where we 20 odd years later and now we're kind of running it as a is a part as a business but still very much as a family hobby as well yeah as a lifestyle as a venture. lifestyle yeah mm-hmm. yeah for all the family because everybody's involved yeah mm-hmm. yeah and how big's your family? Look like? So there's there's my me and my uh, brother. Um, my brother's two years younger than me. He has a separate business with my dad, but he's very much involved in in everything here. Um, and then there's my mom and dad. And then we have my partner Mike, um, who uh, we've been together about eight nine years now. Um, so when I met Mike, he was uh, a civil engineer. And about two and a half years ago, we made another lifestyle decision that um, Mike would leave that career and work full time at the paddock and we would run it together. So I had set up as a sole trader um, in 2013 and been running it myself with um, the help of the family and some staff members. Um, Mam had taken early retirement in 2015, I think it was. So she came to work part time with me and then it was 2000 and was it 18 or 19 I think 18 I think it must have been now mm-hmm. that Mike left his job as a civil engineer to come full full time with the paddock and then we 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 then re-established it as a limited company and, and split it 50 50 so Mike's equally um is yeah he's a partner and I'm mm-hmm. a partner basically um yeah and and we run it together now so um then there's my brother's partner Yasmin as well so we still have my still very lucky to have one grandma my mom's uh, my dad's mom um she's 85 she lives next door to the shop so you can often see us <laughs> t- tottering in on a stick and uh, yeah it's, yeah she's quite happy to say hello um and then we have um I think because we're such a small team obviously you think of the staff members who help as well as family too so steve who runs the farm shop he's really really important part of what we do now um and then we have um another sort of three or four local kind of community members who work with us who help us to do the veg box scheme throughout the week so um yeah and obviously that the the team's changed over the years but we've had many like great people involved in in the kind of building and growing of of the paddock along the way so yeah i'm sure yeah. so you're providing organic ethical food that's vegetables the idea yeah yeah to, to lots of people what's your outreach in the northeast is it so by mileage or how, how do you do it so we deliver to quite a large area and um, that that map's drawn on the home page of the of the website i'm not actually sure what the mile radius is but it covers parts of northumberland parts of county durham all of Newcastle and all of Gateshead. So um, then we do have the um, the relationship of the drop sites with How like, many of those um, do you have? so we have um, by the Kilo and Time Mouth, the Weight Shop in Durham, Something Good in Jesmond, 109 in um, Heaton. Um, we have trialled with Zilk Warehouse in South Shields as well. We've put a pause on that for the time being, but hopefully we can restart that in, in the kind of busier period in the run up to Christmas. Mm-hmm. And then we've just started a new um, a new relationship with Cycles Fitness Gym in Bladen, um, offering kind of like a set price veg box for members of his gym um, as part of his kind of well-being and healthy eating kind of programme that he runs. Obviously, he is a PT and he does run a gym, but he's very, very keen on nutrition and organic food specifically so what he recommends to his clients is an organic diet so we've come up with a veg box to fit in with that um so so in effect there's six places um sort of overall that you could collect a veg box from um there are areas like uh, like um by the kilo over by the coast where where you get your veg box from and um, we don't do home delivery over there so we only offer to the drop site Mm-hmm. Um, so whilst the reach is quite broad there are certain different relationships but overall doing about sort of somewhere between 200 to 300 drops a week um, generally speaking although we are in our kind of quieter time of year so like last week was only 160 um, so it's it's the quieter time of year July and August but certainly um, over the last year at points we've been up to doing uh, about 320 um drops a week at, t- at times so have you had to stop taking orders at some point because i know did, riverford yeah. did just start doing that did they, they right. were just they were just hitting their their maximum yeah we did yeah we did um so when the uh, when the pandemic first hit um our orders more than doubled over, like literally overnight it was cr- yeah, it was just sure. crazy um and then we basically just had to stop and um took a waiting list but the waiting list got up to well over a thousand people in the end so then we tried to do a priority system whereby elderly vulnerable isolated nhs but even then 
you just couldn't fit everybody in. So we basically capped ours around about the 320 mark. That mm -hmm. was kind of our max. That was what we could do with our little team. And that was us all working really hard, you know. Um, plus there's other, you know, you, you know, issues like there's the supply. You can't just all of a sudden magic up all that extra yeah. food, you know. It, it doesn't come from nowhere. So, and you had to be fair to everybody because um, every box scheme was experiencing the same thing. So, and we're all using the same suppliers. So, there's only so much you could do. So yeah, we did have to cap it. And that actually, that went right through from sort of March last year, in March, April, till about August when we got quieter last year. Then we lifted it for a couple of months and then it went really busy again. Um, and obviously we went back into lockdowns and things. So we kind of kept that on from about September till early this year. And then since then we've lifted it um, and things have settled down and we just kind of take it week by week mm -hmm. by week yeah when you were pushing that kind of you know pushing your limits of what you could physically do <laughs> and logistically do um with your supply chains and stuff were, were you experiencing any like compromises that you perhaps weren't okay with and then that's what you know perhaps made the decision to, to to stop taking orders and just to grow a list of people that were obviously passionate about getting more organic veg and so for for the paddock um we've always been slightly unusual in many conversations i've had like this and 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 the way we see ourselves running in that we've always talked and always had waiting lists and caps and things we've never that was the most we'd ever done and we we felt a social responsibility to try and do as much as we could at that time because there was so much going on in the world and you felt you had to do your part it would have been we felt a bit wrong not to try and help as many people as possible because we were all none of us knew what was you know what was going on and what was coming um but for us the the box scheme has never we could have easily been doing now a thousand boxes a week easily or more you know but we would have had to look for new premises we would have had to change everything really that the paddock was about and you find yourself becoming I suppose more of a manager and trying to org organize the logistics and the admin and all the paperwork and less involved in it I suppose in the day-to-day yeah. -day. and that's, management aren't you yeah and that's never what it's been about for for myself and for Mike and for the paddock the paddock has always been about providing local food for local people on a relatively small scale. I mean, we're, a, uh, we're still classed as a small business, but we're a reasonable size small business, but we don't have any plans for that to get any bigger. So there's no, it's not about making it an exclusive club or anything like that, but it's just about finding a comfortable balance where we provide a service, but we do it within the realms, I suppose, of what we're comfortable with and also make sure that for the family, because, you know, it is so entwined with the family, that there is still a, a lifestyle there that isn't all consumed by the paddock because obviously for myself and Mike, my partner, to work together, to live together, to spend 24 hours a day together, it's easy for that business to all consume you and, therefore, and, and, and for you to... For, to, for you to forget why A, I started it in the first place and B, why Mike left a, a job like civil engineering three years ago. You know, he he worked in flood defences. He was on more than twice the income he's at at the paddock. He, he could have gone, he, he was already at like sort of project manager level and he could have taken that a lot further if he'd wanted to, but he made a choice to change his lifestyle for a reason. So it's important, I suppose, to find that balance where the business doesn't take over that lifestyle yeah, option 100 percent. i um, completely know what you're saying and i appreciate that you have that approach mindset integrity mm. about you and you're only going to like attract that it, uh, from a spiritual point of view from literally a, an emotional point of view so there's that but there's also the side that you you've gone against the grain here because it's not common in our culture to take that approach mm. and to 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 check in with your values mm. and to you, you know there's a there's a question uh, uh, which I'd love to go into about like your education around why that is and why that's so important to you because what's common in our culture and in the West is that we we, we just we, we we take the money and run and you know for for lack of a better phrase yeah, we, no, we do and we, and we but that's encouraged it really is it's mm. profit for profit's sake and that's just the 
that's just the grain that's the natural flow of this system we seem to be a part of um and and it's encouraged in business to grow to get shareholders to do this and it seems to be like that's put up here as success mm -hmm. when yeah. you're redefining your success yeah i think yeah i think success has become very much defined by material possessions and money and obviously you know i'm under no illusion that i'm very very fortunate in my life to be sitting here in this position now you know surrounded by six and a half acres that's owned by my family to be running the shop from a building that's owned by my family you know to have the time to, to do a podcast have like the this. time to do a podcast <laughs> like this to be looking at my horse in the field like yes these things all sound as though i'm being slightly hypocritical in a way because i'm sitting with these things that are around me that are considered wealth you know land yeah. property horses it's considered wealth but it's come from a place of really hard work so my parents both grew up on council estates you know with very little my nana was a manager at greg's and um, my granddad worked in the shipyards my grandma and granddad on the other side they worked hard to build up a, a business that was the soft finishes and textiles we've not you know had I, I, I'm not playing a tiny little violin for myself here, but it, it wasn't handed to us on a on a silver platter. It was through hard work. I come from a family of everybody being self-employed. I've grown up around my dad going from, you know, the business doing really well to literally like having nothing and having to lay everybody off. Like we've we've been there. We've been through all these all these things as a family, as many people who are self-employed do. And I suppose it's been I suppose a good, uh, uh, I've had a brilliant upbringing, an absolutely brilliant upbringing for many, many reasons, but that hard work ethic that's been instilled in me all the way along has made me really resilient. And I think that's part of what's helped me to get the paddock to where it is today. Cause you know, there's been loads of knockbacks along the way. Everybody sees a sort of a social media presence and a website and they're like, oh, it's doing really well. They don't know that actually like, you having to use your credit card to just put diesel in the van because you've got no, no money in the bank, you know? But you made that choice. And if you believe in it, you can get it going. I'm still pay, paying off like loans and, and credit cards from this, the setup of the business. So there's no denying you can't get somewhere without money. Unfortunately, money is just part of modern society, but it's whether you kind of define, I suppose, your life going forward by the money you have or is it for me it was about creating a job that I cared about that I felt fashion, passionate about that I felt was making a difference that I enjoyed that gave me a comfortable enough standard of living um, and has then been able to give Mike a comfortable standard of living and give my mom three days a week work in her sort of semi-retirement because she retired sort of um at 55 from quite a well a really stressful job um and now you know dad and, and dad's involved in it and we're all it's something we can share together like we sit down we, we have a joke that we have a board meeting on a morning but we get up at like seven o'clock and there's normally some conversation about the paddock and what's happening today or oh, that might happen at like half eight at night because you, you know it's very hard to separate it off when it's part of the family but if it's bringing enjoyment to us, then um, that's really where it's like it's that's worth its weight in gold. I guess mm -hmm. is the, probably the best way to say it. Yeah, yeah. and I think the, the the privilege aspect of it that we all kind of feel the weight of now, mm. because it's it's just <laughs> seems to be a theme that's just knocking around constantly. And for people that want to look, it, you you have to look at what is your privilege and what you've been blessed with and born into and we've got so, so much information about the world and how most of the population are living mm. We're, if you want to look you it, there's a lot there and it, it can be quite a weight to carry and it's difficult difficult uh, ground to kind of navigate because um it, it, it's just <laughs> for our generation for those that want to look there's a, there's a lot of noise about a lot of things mm -hmm. and if you don't have like such a, a grounding then you can really get just snowed under with 
the weight of your privilege and, mm. and you're supposed to well you're born into it there's nothing you can do about it and you'll forever have it and it's like well hold on a minute that doesn't really sound quite right mm. you know I think it's how you use it isn't it how you use it to try and do a bit better so obviously we dad worked really hard uh, mum and dad were able to afford to buy this land land was a lot cheaper then like a lot cheaper you know you're talking 20 years ago we've then worked really hard to get it to where it is it's never finished. We're just cu- custodians of this land. We're just looking after it. You know, it will go on for generations to come and people will hopefully continue to, to look after it. But it's, it, it, yeah, it's easy to kind of look, I suppose, on the outside at what somebody has in terms of material possessions. But it's how you, I think it's how you use them. So for, for us with the paddock, there's no doubt organic food comes from a privileged point of view you know yeah. and, and to, be, isn't it? to be able to afford organic food in this country is 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 a privilege there's no doubt about that it is but th- i mean you could put that down to g- government structure and and systems well, and what we're a part it. of of mm-hmm. course because now it is now it's like you know veganism and, and to support yourself with a healthy diet and not have um you know not have meat a part of it or animal products you really have to put a lot of time and money into it to get back the the, the healthy lifestyle that you're perhaps you know that you perhaps want mm. but so so it's almost considered goes hand in hand with yoga practice and things like this and and it's almost considered like yeah like middle class to to, to choose these options definitely and i think organic food it, it is a higher price point you know there's no denying that but there are there are real reasons behind that it is it, it's a it's a higher input system generally speaking it yeah. costs more but it's also it's a fair reflection of what it has cost someone to produce that food because ultimately what's happened is supermarkets have driven prices so far down that we think that those that 50p bag of potatoes is what something is what we should be paying for something and ultimately that's that's the that's the wrong there actually the real price of the food is being more accurately reflected in organic food of course if the market it's still fairly niche re- relatively speaking the the more a market grows and the more people buy into it the more you ha- people you have producing organic food etc cetera, etc cetera, prices do start to come down but in the current system whereby farmers have to pay for certification to be organic it's never going to come down that far because you're not being subsidized to be an organic farm you are paying to be certified organic so then on top of that you have all of your costs your overheads your labor everything you know so it is more expensive but there is a reason behind it but it has sort of become as i suppose like yeah a a slightly privileged um sort of option but what we wanted to try and do with the box scheme and it's why we started the box scheme first was to try and make organic food more accessible so rather than setting up with a shop that then did delivery um obviously shops had always relied farmers shops and everything um had always relied on people coming to us and we know that we're all very busy now and 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 time you know time poor a lot of the time so um the box scheme was designed with trying to make good quality organic ethical food more accessible to people by taking it to their doors and we started off with you know a, a, a value veg box was one of the first options and that was only seven pound fifty um for delivery as well we never we didn't charge for delivery or anything obviously price of everything has gone up as it has now and the the, the cheapest box is now 12 pound 50 and only two weeks ago have we started our first ever mandatory delivery charge which is 50p per person unless that's regardless unless you collect from a drop site and that's just because over the last couple of years we've seen the prices rising so much we've seen the haulage prices rising so much that we we just can't keep like absorbing that all ourselves so but we really have tried to keep the prices as affordable as possible for people to make it more accessible um you know I, I often make a joke and I say you don't go into fruit and veg if you want to get rich that's not what you do you know um so it's not it's never been about all about money for us but obviously you have to get to a certain point to achieve a certain standard of living and to be able to you know afford to yeah yeah absolutely let's talk about food because I, I firmly believe that it's an unsustainable myth that we can just produce food on scale and make it cheap 
and yep. uh, that affordable that people don't even think what they're buying they don't even think what they're throwing away anymore yeah it's waste is such a i think it was 900 trillion tons of food that was wasted in a year in england um oh, sorry in the uk and it's a scary statistic is because the wastes are part of that because if you're really buying food for a high price point you're going to make sure you use it all so mm -hmm. there you're solving one bit of a bit of a little simplistic way but there's, there's a big problem there and it doesn't doesn't make sense but the unsustainable myth is that we scale scale food and then just yeah it's causing a lot of disruption to the planet to it's it's not i'm not the first to say this that agriculture it's really um especially in america it's it, it's really causing some big problems in the world mm -hmm. um but the, the way you're doing this, I walk around the small holding and I'm like, you're connected, you're feeling, you're, you're getting your functional movement in, but you're also like like going around the, the small holding and you're a part of it all and you're connected to it. And y the thing is doing, you know, this is like a traditional way of living, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's It's going back to how we once were. And we have to do that. We have to move towards that. We have to start doing this at a community level. And there are, like, we're a creative, imaginative species. There are ways of doing this. Like, you're proving that we can give people organic local food, but doing it in a creative way. But that is, that does mean, like, going to your, yeah, I haven't got the money to pick up or get deliveries. I go to my drop site and, and, and go, go get my veg box and speak to your fellow people in your community and see if you can come together and then you know perhaps someone goes to pick it up one week and then y you know you're a part of it and I think doing things at this like community level it, we have to start we have to start thinking about this yeah I think yeah I think we have to start thinking about more th the local more don't we um we've become obviously a globalized world <laughs> and, yeah yeah absolutely and there's that's n probably never been more at the forefront than this last year i think in the way the pandemic has spread worldwide and really hasn't left anyone untouched really and um, obviously it's affected everybody in some way but everybody in different ways as well but the way that it did spread so quickly and and you know that like that's brought the kind of global interconnected world really to the forefront i think none of us are none of us are an island on our own <laughs> if yeah. you like um and i think the 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 way that we've kind of upscaled food to feed feed the world um isn't i don't think it's sustainable long term you know i i don't want to sound as though we're saying that someone's farming in a wrong way for farming a certain way because i do believe in i do believe in british farming and i do believe in the the generations and generations of farmers who have you know farmed farms and are, are doing it maybe in more of a, a, a general agricultural sense what i think we probably need to do is look a bit more at how we run farming as a business rather than just a subsidy um so british farmers heavily subsidized and to me it seems a bit skewed that we're subsidizing farming that does use you know the use of for example pesticides and neosecticides and fer artificial fertilizers and then we're asking organic farmers to pay yeah. to be certified for feed for organic to, feed. to food to feed people naturally to me there's something there's something gone wrong there <laughs> that's Absolutely. that's something that i, 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 I can never when, get my head when around. antibiotics the same ones that will take for an infection get fed to animals to allow them to grow quicker and to to just <laughs> get a short burst of their life they, it, that, that, that's all consuming we're, we're, we're also a part of that system and it's like there's th that's cheaper than doing it in a natural way mm -hmm. that's it's it's a lot there it's quite it's quite scary really when you start to like dig dig into it um and yeah i find it i find it quite traumatic um kind of like the mass scale farming of of animals i'm not vegan and i'm not vegetarian so i'm not you know at, at the paddock we try and provide as many sustainable lifestyle options and food options as we can for people so we don't pigeonhole ourselves into a specific vegan vegetarian meat eating category we offer products from a range of suppliers that we've built up relationships with that we believe in that we trust in and um 
it's then for the consumer to make that decision, you know. So if we have loads of customers who are vegan, we have loads of customers who are vegetarian, and um, we don't stock, for example, meat and um and and um most of the dairy products like milk, fresh milk, the the fresh dairy products, excluding cheese, obviously has a longer date. But the things that you really need to use within a week, we don't stock them on site. So that's all done to pre-order. And um, I think for the shop per week, we buy ten pints of milk. Um, and we don't really sell a lot of milk through the shop so you know that tends to get used for staff teas and things like that so we don't buy any um kind of fresh dairy that needs to be turned around quickly um t to just see if it sells we do it all via pre-order same with the meat so we only get dropped the meat that we've already sold so that's tackling the 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 waste issue there's other other things you know like with our meat, for example, it's all frozen. So if it when a when a when a beast is ready to be slaughtered, um, the whole animal is butchered and then deep frozen. So the farm that we work with for the meat keep all of the fr the the meat deep frozen on site. I think you've got roughly about eighteen months to sell frozen meat as opposed to like a few days for fresh and then they just drop up with us what we've had customers order from us so it's trying to work out those little relationships i suppose with people on a local level and don't get me wrong that there's no way that kind of relationship is going to work on a global level that's only working because that's a small 100%. local relationship that we've been able to establish but that's but a mindset thing isn't it as well if so if it's we had shift. more of those local relationships being established which like you said can come from community farming and 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 maybe creative ways of people thinking about how they you know how they maybe get a veg box together or they use a drop site or whatever it is and um, then we can kind of take out a lot of the problems that surround waste and and kind of sustainability yeah it's it's tough for, it's tough for people and i want to just share a bit of my experience of me being more conscious with food um but i think it is that it's it's conscious being conscious is like the root of all of this definitely because someone who's conscious is curious is open who's eager to learn who's eager to look at perhaps the light and dark sides of things and if you if you if you if you're not acting consciously then you're only going to be feeding into the system which is going to extract it's going to it's going to profitize from you it's going to it's going to probably make some bad decisions based on your lack of awareness about things which which is generally generally what happens um but the more more conscious you are then the more the decisions that you're making perhaps you're not taking those bananas from costa rica and those almonds from california but you're making decisions about what makes sense of that field you know three kilometers away and i'm eating from them mm. so i'm not contributing to all these problems that occur from taking fruit and veg from other countries so does that make more sense than you know, just going teetotal with meat and dairy and all the rest of it maybe it's something to look at mm. it's not just like like the i've never branded myself one because i don't know who i'm going to be in two years i don't want to label put myself in a in a box and call myself a vegan or a vegetarian i might ask for a vegan menu mm -hmm. but that's as far as i wanted to go with it because it's it's just a big experiment i put a post out the other day about me catching mackerel in the north sea mm -hmm. and i was like the, that experience was like it was it was emotional experience of like making that experience sacred again and getting connected to where that fish comes from mm -hmm. and me and my partner we've been going on this journey with like local source fish and create listening to our bodies of how we actually feel when we eat the food and also how we feel when we go and catch the food it's mm -hmm. it's, it's it's a part of that kind of conversation but for me like how i started to get more conscious with food was when i was similar to you i went over to australia and i was put on the a work scheme which was three months agricultural work so you got i, I went and i was traveling to get a second year visa you get your three months in agriculture yeah which is be a beautiful way to connect with people locally to do something for the for the for the country and i ended up on a sheep farm it had like 13,000 sheep. I think it was like something like 10,000 acres or something ridiculous. The, I mean, the, the, the farmer was in a plane and we were on quad bikes trying to catch these sheep to put them into the run of the, the pad, their paddock. And it was just this, this, 
this is just the, the flat they call it because mm-hmm. it's just an it's the outback and that for me like at the time oh, we were eating one bull that they would shoot and then cut and we would eat that and we would eat um like some vegetables that you'd get from from the markets and stuff like once every three months when he picked the local the local kids up to come and help him but it took two weeks to rear these sheep and put them through the the process and the pens and he would select breed but the, just the whole experience of that and spending the time there firstly having the time to to, to have some introspection on the process um but then be really connected to that experience watching the sheep go off in a vehicle when i spent like a couple of days with them sorting them getting to know some of them in a way and having that really connected experience when i came back i was like right i just need to i'm, I'm cutting everything out and i'm almost starting from the bottom with like my food and just really making some conscious decisions because i just kept walking down supermarket aisles and just overthinking yeah. I just, it's overthinking and i'm like uh, 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 I, no I'm not sure about that and they're picking up things and I'm like reading the backs and, and I just have this kind of freak out anxiety attack in a supermarket because I'm just like how is this it, I don't feel privileged to be in this supermarket it actually feels too overwhelming mm. um, I feel more privileged when I'm out at sea catching a fish it's like well, should we like there's so much in a store and you're like you've got everything you've got everything you could possibly want in this store surely I should be having an elated experience but I'm actually feeling quite the opposite I'm quite disconnected and it's all packaged up so that was probably a little insight into my journey with food and then I've just kind of built it up from there and it's been a whole process of being more aware of things but yeah yeah well uh, to be honest some of what you said there's quite similar to because I obviously grew up with the the you know around like dad having the allotment and keeping chickens like my dad used to I went to Durham University and uh, my dad used to bring the eggs over to Durham University mm-hmm. for us so that I had eggs from our own hens and things you know so I grew up around that but don't get me wrong I went through university like a typical student just yeah, eating rubbish and drinking and doing all that you know and then I finished uni and I went went I went to New Zealand um and did my two years there um working holiday visa similar thing to you and I did work on loads of different farms I worked with sheep as well and um fruit picking and all sorts and the kind of um food scene over there was really good um organic was quite a big thing farmers markets were big local was big um and it was it was it was such a (laughs) such a crazy Farm, farming isn't subsidized there it's run more uh, business-like but it was such a crazy thing to see that um new zealand lamb was cheaper here in the uk than it was in new zealand like and the way they sorted for export versus imp- like local market you know and it it yeah it was that was, new zealand was the start of my journey and i worked on a fantastic farm for about three four weeks where we uh did like woofing um so you know um working in exchange for accommodation basically mm-hmm. um and they had built a house and it was a, a total eco house it was compost and toilets it was all rainwater harvested it was all solar and um they were running on i think it was 55 hectares and they were doing everything they were completely living off their like their own land and um you know they would be exchanging they, they reared some sheep and they would maybe be exchanging some of their lamb for some extra grazing when they needed it and things like that you know and and everything we were in a really hot summer it'd been really hot that year and we'd had no rain for ages and um and the the water was running really low and like we could only have a shower like once every couple of days and um you know th- those kind of things it, because the the water wasn't just going to come from unless it rained there was no if that water ran out there was no water you know and you had the animals and everything to think about as well and we had to one of the big things we did while we were at that farm was um they had re- replanted loads of native forest and obviously the the tree saplings needed to be watered because they would they would have eventually died and that would have been a huge waste so one of the things we had to prioritize the water usage for was for watering all of these native trees this native forest that they'd they'd replanted and it was a fantastic experience and before that that was sort of, sort of towards the end of my my journey in New Zealand when I already had the ideas for the paddock and what I wanted to do but in the lead up to that I'd really like the 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 year and a half prior to that uh, the two years prior to that taking like myself on a journey about learning about my food and like being fit and sort of healthy and trying to like eat properly and cook from scratch and because yeah university was just 
takeaways and packaged food and you never even thought about it and drinking and I just by the time I'd finished university at 21 I just I just didn't like it anymore I, I just didn't want to go out partying and I didn't want to drink and I didn't want to and I mean don't get me wrong I have like an occasional cider or something now but I hardly ever really drink um and I think it's just it's about finding that yeah I suppose it was about finding that connection with food which New Zealand helped me to do in a similar way I think it sounds like Australia probably did for you and then I remember that feeling you you just described about being in a supermarket when I came back because the last four weeks of New Zealand had been living on this this really sustainable farm and um, everything was composted it was all compost and loose it was and I came back and like I went to a shop and like cosmetics and everything were really cheap and everything was really cheap like compared to New Zealand and I and I was looking for natural natural products, like natural shower gels and stuff. Because you imagine you just come back with your backpack, you've got nothing really, like, and you go back to your parents and you've got all these big ideas and implemented compost bins in the kitchen at mom's and things like that, you know? And it was like, right, you've got to roll all your compost in there now. And, and the toilet flushed and the shower just turned on. And, like, you went to the supermarket and it was all just, yeah, it like you just said in plastic packaging, it was all so easy and it was so cheap. And the lamb was cheaper than it had been in New Zealand. And it said country of origin, New Zealand. And I was like... But why? <laughs> it's the other side of the world. Don't we sheep farm here, you know? So I suppose that that's probably, I suppose, going and doing that and then coming back to this is probably a, as big a part of the journey as the journey itself, I think, because if you didn't remove yourself from it and then come back to it, you wouldn't see just how different it is. Um, and I couldn't believe, yeah, 2013, the lack of availability of eco-friendly cleaning products in supermarkets, like eco-friendly body care, um, you know, like even th little things like recycled toilet paper. We weren't really talking about local food in the same way. Um, but I, when I started digging, I found that there was loads of local producers and it was like, right, how do we... Yes, I had the idea for the box scheme and the eggs and stuff, but how do we connect up all of like the local producers? So the how do we bring the bread in and the honey in and the jams and the chutneys? And actually, once you started digging, you realised how many people were doing it. So then I suppose the paddock became more of a way of joining up all those people. Um, so that now, you know, we work with, I'm not even sure the, the total number of suppliers, but there's about 800 to 1,000 product lines in, in the shop and on the website overall. Um, from suppliers not just within Newcastle Gates and Northumberland Durham now but UK wide um, and it's amazing how much we are producing on small scales you know and we have we have we have suppliers contacting us all of the time with new products I'm I'm just I'm often sad that we can't get back to everybody and that we can't stock everything you know but there is so much happening at a local level I suppose it's how we kind of get that out to people that's one of the 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 issues i suppose yeah and just perhaps for lack of a better word awake waken people up to realize that, that that products are out there they are accessible they can be affordable but perhaps that little bit extra that you're paying it's going to go a hell of a long more long it's going to go a longer way than going to your supermarkets and, and just taking what's off the shelf it is more amazing that it, it's not s promoted it's not it's not advertised. It's not talked about on our national news. Like that, that, that things like this are beneficial to us and our ecosystem, which is one of the same. And we're still living in this way that is one disconnected, but also just, just clearly not sustainable. Yeah, we're not talking about it. Um, I mean, I think there's conversations going on all of the time, but I think you've got to look for those conversations. So yeah, which is more alarming that. <laughs> You have to look for them, yeah. And you have to go out of your own way, or, or, or perhaps the norm to, to to find this. But they are out there, as you've just alluded to. Um, have you ever visited these farms, these organic, you know, big big places that you've uh, you, that you get your stock from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, like one of the the farms that we work with in North Yorkshire, um, the organic pantry, um, they are on three hundred acres. They're a family run farm. Yeah, I've been down there. We've worked with them since since the beginning. Um, I haven't visited every farm that we that we work with, but you know we're in um mostly daily contact with a lot of suppliers because obviously it's fresh produce so it's um the the bulk of what we do is fresh produce so it's um it's coming 
it's changeable on a daily basis so you're in regular constant contact with yeah, people so you, you build relationships i think that would shock a lot of people that there are so many just on your roster mm. you know that there are so many that you pull from all those different streams um i think that would that would surprise some people probably yeah because yeah yeah i guess so i mean on the more local level you know obviously the the farms and, and the people we work with like directly in our locality obviously we've visited all of them we know them you know it we see them regularly it's it it's it, yeah. it starts to develop into quite a personal relationship it, yeah and it has to be that because you you go in your supermarket and you'll be forgiven for thinking that we don't really grow anything in the uk well you because would yeah it's and especially well unless it's you know in season and, and you're and you're looking at the back and you can see it's from surrey or and it becomes i suppose a bit of a f- I suppose what a supermarket makes it easy to do is forget that there's a person behind that product. Like mm-hmm. every product you're buying in that supermarket in terms of fruit, veg, fresh produce, there's a person running a farm somewhere <laughs> to make yeah. that product, yeah. you know, whether it be dairy, whether it be um, uh, fresh fruit and veg, whether it be meat, whether it be honey, whatever it is, that started somewhere with a person. And I suppose supermarkets have made it quite faceless to shop now. There's no face or relationship behind the product. Yeah, I guess M and S try and do that with their British farmers scheme, but Yeah, I mean it's because yeah, there's I mean I suppose there's M and S and there's the co op, the, there's certain ones that kind of try and pr- push, you know, you can't tart like everything with the same brush, but there are certain ones that try and push the the British farm inside of things more. Yeah, and I'm, it's not, I'm not convinced because one, it's just, it's proven to be, you can't scale this kind of organic, fresh food. Mm. It just won't travel. Like we get a pick up a box on a Friday. We do every two weeks. So we swap with you uh, and then have a river for the next week and yeah. then back to you. So we have one big, large veg box a week. But I, I love it when food's starting to go off because I'm like, oh God, I need to eat that. And of course it should be going off. If yeah. your food is not perishing it was it was alive and now it is decaying it's going you know back to its <laughs> to its you know previous existence which was nothing so if it's still there after a week two weeks you really you should be questioning it because yeah. that's not that's not the that's not how life works no so yeah i love it when food starts to go off and it does go off pretty quick so you've got to and that's just testament to the food and and if we don't think that is a good thing Mm. then we again need to check ourselves this is one of the challenges i think we often face as a box scheme is partly education as well because i think uh, obviously we strive to provide a really good quality service and a product like as and and we really myself and the whole team work really really hard for that we really believe in it there's nothing more disheartening than if you get a complaint about quality um it's horrible but at the same time sometimes this is a natural product and it will just happen and we can't get every you know every bean or every carrot or whatever out there without some kind of natural decay in it and we can honestly pack something and within a few hours in the heat we've been having recently by the time that gets to a customer's door it doesn't look like when (laughs) it left our workroom and it came out the fridge you know so it, it is hard to toe that line between kind of doing providing a good service providing good good value for money and good quality and and kind of reminding ourselves that that this is natural i mean we had a problem with carrots for example a while ago and yeah there were a few people who were um in touch about the quality of the carrots and then i I had a conversation with another customer who gets an awful lot of carrots in a week and i thought i better email them to say you know "I, i hope it's okay you know and he was just so sensible about it. And he just said, I, I like that. Well, p- pretty much what you've just said there. Yeah. Like, I like that a natural product is acting naturally. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's showing that we're not a fraud, that we are providing organic food. It hasn't been treated with anything to keep it fresh. And um, we are just trying to turn it around as quickly as possible. And that's why we do our veg boxes in like a 48 hour turnaround. So from coming in to going out, that's it, 48 hours. So we start Tuesday morning. It's all out and with customers by Thursday afternoon. So that's what we we've tried extra delivery days and things like that, but it didn't work. And and that's why we always advise like with the drop sites picking up on the day that we drop it if you can, because then it's it's going to be as fresh as we can possibly provide it. But you do need to be conscious of 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 how you use the food, I suppose. And it's 
you know, when you look at a veg box and at this time of year, you might have half of it greens and half of it more rooty stuff. You might think, well, I'll cook with the green stuff more for the first half of the week because the rooty stuff's going to last a little bit better. So it's how we change the way we cook. And for some people that really works and that actually really helps them to decrease the waste in the household because they're cooking with what they've got and they're conscious of what they've got to use. For other people, it doesn't, it doesn't always work, you know, for various reasons. But that's why we found offering the set price box option alongside the creator box option helps because if you do like to kind of meal plan or cook to certain you know, diets or whatever if you can create your own box then you're able to avoid waste by getting not getting things you might have allergies to or you might not eat or whatever you know yeah so that kind of surprise you um we love surprises <laughs> in our box it's like like i love the, the odd box that, that, that uh, i think that's in london i don't know if it's more than that right Maybe it's in a few and um, few counties but odd box where they give you just all the odd fruit and all the odd shapes and sizes which is a great um it's a great sales point i think but yeah the box that we get just so creative with it it's like we are creative as as beings and it's it's really important to tune into that with our cooking of course if you don't want to i've got the time it does take more time to be creative but when you receive a box you don't necessarily know what it's going to get it's it's all good food so you want to cook with it and it does push you to be more creative with it Mm. and tune back into that well it's like we have this we call it the staff box at work and it's like the dodgy the dodgy potato or the slightly soft squash or whatever it is you know or there might be a few odds and ends left from the week before or something like that and we put that in and everybody's welcome to just take what they want and do what with what they want and steve our shop manager now does staff smoothies so he's gotten into making smoothies from the staff box so um yeah it's just about trying to find different ways and he makes one for me and mike to share because he's took it home and he's made it and then he brings one back for us and um it's it, it, yeah because i'll admit like i don't always cooking from scratch is really important for me but i'm not at home every night cooking a, a big slap up meal you know it's not fine dining and uh it, and i go to people's houses and people feel on edge about the food that they're giving me because <laughs> of what i do and and I, I you know for me and mike it's quite simple a lot of the time like the i think every night now for a week there's been a salad involved in some kind of shape or form um and that might it's some nights it might just be that we've got some eggs that need use so it's scrambled eggs at, like two nights ago with some toast from the shop scrambled eggs some fresh basil and tomatoes and that was tea you know because we finished late and it's quick and it's easy and you've got a bit of protein you've got a bit of veg and and when we're on the go all day you know we'll we eat a banana we we're not we're not perfect like we still buy things in plastic we did but it's 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 trying to it's like if I go now and I have to buy something that I suppose I can't get otherwise um for whatever reason and it is in plastic I have like that inner battle with myself you know about what you need and you don't and so I suppose that's that consciousness that you were talking about and sometimes you can't avoid it. At the minute, I'm finding um, with my caravan up on the coast that my constant inner battle is the rubbish. So people's rubbish. And I'm, it's been really getting me and Mike down. And, and that goes back to that thing, I suppose, of how much you get buried under the weight of everything going on. But we go up to our caravan often on a Saturday evening and it gets really obviously it's school holidays at the minute. It gets really busy. Um, and by Saturday evening, the bins are overflowing. And actually, it's one of the best campsites in Northumberland for recycling. There's really good recycling on site. And so the campsite manager, the owner, he's actually really good. He actually sorts through people's rubbish to get out the recycling. And I think that's brilliant. Um, And I would like to help him more, but I think um, I have these ideas. And then I realise actually I haven't got the time for everything to save the whole world. But yeah, I go and it's overflowing and I just, it just makes me really sad makes me really sad yeah because we're obviously doing that on a huge scale across the whole yeah country you know and it's all this and there's food just thrown in there loose and we've got compost bays there so and and it's just all this plastic and it's bagfuls of mixed recycling just put in general waste and and it does become quite hard to kind of like um i don't know what the best way to put it is but um not let it get you kind yeah, of down absolutely. a little bit i think when 100%. you yeah then you just got to appreciate that the world has moved so quickly change has has, has come hasn't <laughs> it in the last you know few centuries and it's like it's radical change radical population growth it's like yeah. a lot has happened in this last 50 100 years and we've just got to sometimes tune into that and know that pff, 
we're here for a small amount of time. We yeah. can only do so much. Oh, definitely. Yeah, we are here for literally a second in the grand scheme of things. And, you know, no one really knows what the bigger things are at play. Like, we really just we really just don't. And it, and it does pay to just tune into that and not let things like that get you down. It, I mean, it does get me down. Really. I put something in the bin. And, and I've actually become a bit more relaxed about it recently because it did start to... The general waste, for example. Yeah. Um, that I was really particular about because all of our food waste we'll, we'll put in a compost out, out, out the back. And that's that's amazing just to tune into that and just mm. watch it diminish like... Sorry, we, that's my phone. I'll just... got uh, a theme tune. I, ha- I haven't actually... You know what? It's just the fo- It's the phone tune that was on oh, there yeah. and I'm so non-tech savvy. It was just... It's never been changed. Sounds that's, like Anastasia that's how, or that's something. That's how cool I am. I'm just going to pop, pop it on silent because I'm sorry I hadn't realised that it's wasn't good. on... Uh, that wasn't on silent. There you go. It's all good. It's like pretty the modern, relaxed on the podcast. It's yeah. the modern... It's the modern world intercepting, isn't it? There you go. <laughs> so, so, yeah... What was I saying? Sorry. Com- composting. Yeah, composting. Composting's, yeah, it, it's useful, it's easy. The general waste situation, because I'd go to the, the dump, the tip, and, and like, you know, be particular about where things are going, and, like, the general waste is, like, you have a little look, you peer over the skip, <laughs> and you're, like, really? Yeah. And there's just so much. Yeah, in there. it's the and, waste and, it, is and until it, it becomes... Oh, I don't know. Maybe we'll, yeah, <laughs> these policies will come into play. But you know, us as people, yes, we can protest about it. Oh no, wait. I don't know if that's happening anymore. <laughs> 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 but it's it, it's it's hard for one person to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. Oh, at definitely. The end of the day, <laughs> yeah, and you can't. You can't. I mean, I say to people all the time. You know, our like like I've just said, we're not perfect, and our shop isn't about. And our box scheme and everything isn't about um, striving for perfection to live like the most, you know, the, to live as clean and eco-friendly and green yeah. and everything as it's just about small swaps it's what you can afford to do it's what you feel you can do every small swap makes a difference um, and none of us are perfect none of us are going to be able to do it all but if you can make some some small changes that really makes a difference um, and I think you're constantly constantly learning and uh, yeah it is important to remember all of the good but I suppose sometimes when you do what we do um, and it becomes so ingrained in your habits like putting food waste in a compost bin and things like that then you step out of your little bubble into the wider world which is I suppose what Mike and I do when we leave the paddock um at the end of the week and go to the caravan and have that little base there we're stepping out into a huge cross-section of people and that's like oh okay we still have quite a long way to go (laughs) yeah we're all in our little echo chambers aren't we yeah you suppose I suppose you start to see like Oh, okay, so this is happening like daily, you know, in households across the UK, and and it it starts to make you think like how how do we kind of how do we make those changes? And I suppose a big part of it is is it comes back to education, doesn't it? And I think fundamentally everything does. Yeah, and that's where we need to be starting with. And I think there are some good projects going on. There's good things going in, on in schools now. There's a lot more conversations happening. I know there's there's still a lack of it in the mainstream a lot of the time, but there are a lot more conversations happening about green issues than there, than there were when I started the paddock, certainly. Um, but and, and there are people who've been doing it for a lot lot longer um you know than than us who've been trying to make a noise about it um it's just important i suppose to try and keep getting the message out there keep encouraging people keep um mm-hmm. yeah trying to change habits i suppose have you- I wouldn't do this podcast any service if I didn't mention Biggest Little Farm. <laughs> Have you seen that? <laughs> I haven't. Documentary? No, no, you're not? I haven't. No. Oh wow. Well. So I, I won't go into too much detail. We can talk enough. after. But I spoke about it on the Tony Riddle podcast. Went into kind of the whole ins and outs of it. But it's a beautiful documentary. Okay. About this couple who move to uh, you know a, a few acres similar to this actually, uh, in the desert essentially that right, to so regenerate okay. the soil first of all oh you ha- honestly have to watch oh, it no, i'm gonna get excited when people haven't because <laughs> okay. i'm like oh okay. wow i can give you this gift yep. of telling you about it yeah, I, I i watched it last night right okay. <laughs> in prep um but yeah you'd have to buy it i think it was 5.99 oh, or something yeah. anyway it's it's a beautiful documentary one for the for the for the photography mm. and the videography of it because the guy used to be a uh um, a nature 
photographer. But their whole idea was to basically do everything without any intervention with technology or pesticides, herbicides, mm -hmm. etc., and just do everything naturally. It took them seven years. And I, before Tony podcast, I was like, yeah, God, such a long time. We don't appreciate it. Like, and I'm like, well, actually, that's, that's, that's pretty quick compared to like, you know, the 200,000 years of existence of our species. And it's like, it's a short amount of time. So first of all, checking on what is a long, a, a long time to do something like that. But they basically had to bring in different wildlife and get things moving in a way that everything complemented each other and live in this, it's a great metaphor for life, masculine, feminine, all this kind of like, just yin and yang and everything just existing like you have here like with the wild flowers with the insects and just trying to bring in as much biodiversity as possible so it can kind of feed off each other mm -hmm. and so you've got a which is the world it, it is how the world works everything works in harmony with everything else we can't have one thing without the other and it is complete symbiosis that is an ecosystem it's one of the definitions of of, of an ecosystem and we are that our, our body is that so what we eat we become essentially and mm -hmm. it's the same for the world so i don't really have a question here but no, no, <laughs> fine. No, no. it's the biodiversity side of it like how, how, does that does that play a part in what you're trying to do in your intentions of Definitely. perhaps this the small holding yeah, yeah huge um so i mean i, I mentioned before uh, probably off the podcast but um we were talking about you know the learning process and things like that i mean we've been here 20 20 ish years now and um, obviously the paddock's been going as a kind of enterprise for like eight nine years now um and um we've tried lots of different things you know we've tried traditionally getting a tractor in and rotivate and not using pesticides and fertilizers or anything like that not um we have never done that but you know we've tried the traditional methods of just rotivating with a tractor and then planting direct and and um, it wasn't until about five years ago that I started really um, sort of researching more about no dig gardening and farming and um, and like wild uh, sort of more wildlife gardening. And actually, the plot, plot that's in front of us, which is the main veggie plot, is, isn't the the biggest the biggest space at all. But the amount that's grown in there, um, hopefully you would agree, is quite. I, I think it's quite you know that's packing a lot into a small space i think so um yeah. and and uh, it's not the best day today unfortunately with the rain we haven't seen the bees but the oh, bees it's a good day for them the, oh it's a good day for the veggies yeah but the bees and the butterflies and um it just when you just sit here on a, yeah. on a normal day and watch the plots and the birds you know and we've got sunflowers growing in the pots that have, in the plots that have just come from the birds dropping the seed that we feed them and we've really tried to encourage the biodiversity we try and leave the natural hedgerow we try and encourage the wildflower and um, we do everything without the the use of anything artificial it does mean more manpower it does mean more labor but it's beautiful when you sit here and you watch the bees and the birds and, and, and you just appreciate it. And we're constantly experimenting with new things. There's always something to do. You never finish. This is, it's like I said before, we're just custodians and, and we can do our best and then hopefully someone will continue to do that. But um, no, the ecosystem and, and how everything's interconnected, um, food and nature and us and how we all play a part, that's a, a huge part of what, what we're doing here. And I'm always thinking of something new and thinking oh I wonder if that would work there you know I don't I don't go off any traditional kind of recommendations for how you space something or how you how you how you grow something I really just try and turn my hand at it and give it a go and I see think what it's happens your intuition. yeah you just you, you, you're, you're you're a part of this process you are you're you're an animal you're you're also going from one plant to the other and and you and you're involved just like the insects are involved just like the the germination process of the birds feeding and then excreting and and all of that and, and the birds and insects that will, will die here and decay and then that will feed the soil like that is it it we're all part of it and you watch you watch it you know you can't um create a a garden overnight it doesn't work that way you know if i mean if you move into for example a new house a process i'm going through at the, at the minute um myself and mike bought a, a cottage five years ago that hadn't had anything done with it since 1962 we're talking like mustard formica kitchens and really overgrown garden nothing you know no offense nothing but we 
we started on the house and we we left the garden mostly for the first year and didn't do too much with it apart from starting to try and put fencing up and general tidying up but to get a feel for what was there and although that garden hadn't been touched for at least 10 years um there was so much to it there was like a beautiful wildflower patch of native bluebells there was daffs in there um there was um loads of beneficial plants natural wild chamomile um we had loads of wildflower beautiful foxgloves so the process that i started i i know i did i didn't grow any veg at home I, I just did it for it was a wildlife garden that's how we how we designed it you know um and we just sold it and and that was my biggest the the hardest thing to leave was and i had to have some serious conversations with myself because i had some beautiful plants in there that i really wanted to take with me and um, I was like, no, you know what? These plants belong here. They're part of this ecosystem. Like I can start again somewhere else. Um, but I, I had taken cuttings from neighbors' gardens who, who were in their 80s and 90s and had lived there forever, you know, and um, had these beautiful irises. And it took me three years to get these irises to flower. And last year was the first year. And when we left this year at the end of June, they were just about to flower again. I didn't get to see them for the second year. And the temptation to take those irises out and bring them with me was so, you, you know, like, but I had to fight that because ultimately we built that garden there for that area and we designed it there for that area and, and it was doing a lot of good. We had red squirrels in the trees at the bottom of the garden and yeah. we'd put up boxes for them and we'd, it really was, it, it was a beautiful little spot. And I, I bar one or two things, I think I brought my clematis with me and uh, a couple of little things that I'd kind of planted that could really go anywhere. I did try and just leave it as it was. I hope the new owners can continue that. And then in my new got you know in my new house when we finally get there we'll start to to create i mean it's got a lovely garden but it's a very traditional manicured garden a very tidy garden you know how people how we like to garden in the uk yeah. <laughs> very cut grass with you know perfect lines and things and and obviously when i garden i try and do that more with wildlife in mind and it does create a more kind of wild sort of um look to the garden but when you sit on a day and you watch it and um, then yeah it, it it really gives you like a good feeling to see all those insects and birds and stuff using it and I think to create any garden any veg plot you've got to take the time to be part of it and watch it and not be too keen to yeah it's that battle with the ego for me <laughs> it's like I I I want to see i want to experience that oh no okay that was a perfect analogy of like you coming into contact with this side of yourself that perhaps really was so involved and so in love with the process but then wanted to you wanted to, to experience it so that would have meant taking it out of it and it's like well yeah we do have these we have these conversations and battles every day but you definitely did the right thing there well yeah i think so and don't get me wrong i mean i am I, by nature i'm a person who likes to do and i want it all done yesterday like you know I, i'm i'm a i'm a i guess i'm a doer and i'm mm -hmm. full of kind of constant energy for getting things done um, and i find it really hard to stop and sit back and look and watch this is probably the longest i've sat down at the paddock for mm. a really long time i can't remember how long because i'm always doing you know so why do you think that is i think it's just um i think it's inherent nature i, I think it's uh partly just uh, who i am and partly just um kind of like it's like a busy mind it's like a busy i don't know is your, is your mind person. busy when you're when you're tending to the garden, you're you're, you're no, not my digging. No, but... my mind stops when I'm gardening. Well, there you go. Maybe yeah. that's a part of it. Yeah. Maybe um... your mind starts when you stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably a really good way of putting it, actually. Yeah, um, I have a very busy mind, but I find, and I think lots of people say this about gardening, that that helps to calm the mind. For sure. There's a couple of things for me. That's gardening and horse riding. That's the kind of time when the rest of it does seem to just switch yeah. off and you feel really... I suppose you're more self that you can be. Yeah, you're more in the moment. Yeah, it's when you go back to the kind of the laptop and the emails and the, you know, the, the phones business and the... Business thinking. Yeah, and, and the business thinking the, in the day-to-day, -day, even down to like, oh, God, I've got to do that. I've got to put that washing on. I've got to do that. And I've got to do that. And you, you don't spend a lot of time just saying like, why have I actually got to do that right at this very minute? 
but we all do it, you know? So I think the quietest kind of calmest time for me is is when I'm, yeah, when I'm pottering, that's probably why I don't take long to s- just sit down because then I'm thinking. Whereas when I'm out there, I'm just doing, but I'm doing in a, in a nice, nice is a funny word to try yeah, and describe it. In a nice, way, a ther- therapeutic in a, way, in a, yeah. In a, very, a beneficial way. Yeah. I suppose beneficial to myself because I'm giving myself that time to not be, mm-hmm. zzz, you know, I call it white noise in my head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think we all I get it. Yeah. Like. Um, but uh, beneficial to me, but it's beneficial because beneficial I'm doing something hopefully productive. Yeah, you meaningful know? and uh, contributing also. It's so important for our purpose to be contributing to to other people our community definitely the the things we love to do for the people we love it's uh it's really important for sure and it gives you a sense of purpose right and that's a great feeling you get i think when you've grown food and then you feed it into the box scheme you put it in the shop you know like we've been doing these lovely salad bags with all the edible flowers and um steve who runs the shops really really um really into kind of well the whole ethos of what we do and and he came from a, a a yeah a background of working within the church of england and um last year had redundancy to go through and had been a customer of the shop for about four years before that and um i suppose if you like the the planets aligned and it was the right time and we've made these funny jokes about oh when you're in semi-retirement you'll come and work for the paddock and things like that um and he'd been involved with the veg box scheme many years ago and um and worked for them and stuff so it, it kind of all aligned and, and we were at a time when we really needed to to have someone who could be at the shop all of the time for all of the opening hours to get it back to where it was pre-pandemic, you know, after so many closures and stuff over the last year. And that allowed us the time to continue with the box scheme and focus on here and have the shop open. So we were benefiting all of the community because I just, I didn't have the time and Mike didn't have the time in our week to do the box scheme, to do the plots, to do the shop. And we didn't want any element of it to suffer because it was all equally as important to the community you know because we've got loads of people use the shop that don't use the box scheme Mm -hmm. loads of people who use the box scheme who don't use the shop so we can help a wider community that way and then of course if we left left the plots go and like didn't concentrate on here then you're losing the ethos of why it all started in the first place you know so so that was like, like a big fundamental decision for us was to just be like we need somebody who believes in it as much as we do to run the shop and we've been doing these lovely like bags of kind of edible flowers and um and and salad bags and stuff and um I've been taking it down and Steve puts it out in the shop and he talks to people about it and he believes in it as much as 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 we do and that's that's really that's really important you know it's an important kind of part of the process is um is talking with yeah community members about yeah what there's you're just doing a lot of soul in it and a lot of a lot of energy that's just wrapped it up in it and it's it's people aren't just buying the product they're they're they're, they're buying well, they're experiencing something bigger they're having that conversation about it you know steve's talking yeah. to people about the things he made with the salad leaves and the edible flowers he's showing them photos on his phone he's talking to them about food and then then somebody else will come in and their little girls with them and then he'll go through the box with them that they've pre-ordered for collection and it'll be like oh what's this do you know what this vegetable is so it's um yeah it reaches a lot further out than just um just food um and it touches such a cross section of society like you couldn't pigeonhole our customers you know everybody's different yeah and i think that's a a good approach to life because it's the impact and then the impact of the impact that we need to be thinking about and tuning into because you're making you know you're not just experience giving someone an experience they're gonna take that and feed their family with this like they're gonna take that and then know that experience that they've had at the shop or going to collect their box or receiving their box at the door and like it's just a knock-on effect of like your impact of things uh and it's just a, again it's a more conscious way of, of living isn't it really yeah and you see that di- you see the difference it's making to people people tell you the difference it's making you know we had our had our two-week break and came back to emails people saying i'm so pleased you're back like you know yeah. and and then i see the difference that it's made to you know my life mike's life since he left work and and steve uh, he says he's the happiest he's ever been now working you know in 
in the shop and and being around the food and doing doing this he's 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 really enthusiastic and passionate about it you know and yeah like I see the changes it's made for mum and dad and yeah it's just I suppose you start well it comes back to that thing of um of the ecosystem doesn't it and how yeah. we kind of benefit from us and yeah. from it and it benefits from us yeah I think it's the roots of our human existence. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, we need to kind of go back there. <laughs> Definitely. Well, it's like certain pillars, isn't there? And food's one of them. Community's another. Um, yeah. Health and, and being well-being. Outdoors. Yeah. And, and yeah, health and well-being, which obviously being outdoors and being back to nature and stuff. And they really are probably it is well, that simple not even probably definitely the yeah it is that simple they are the main kind of pillars the rest of it i think if you invest in that part of it follows on you know mm. so it's it's finding that yeah, yeah that as that purpose you have i guess like which is the what what what's the uh-huh. you know what's the one for you like where do you do you know what I'm trying to yeah, say? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. which is your. I just keep thinking of inorganic food as in inorganic humans. Well, <laughs> you yeah, get exactly. That I mean, there's nothing thoughts. more. It's it's all. It really is, and it's. I don't know. Um, it makes so much sense to me, and I know it does to you. You are what you eat. It's a very overused saying. That's what I was just gonna but, say. But it's like, you, you literally are, and that yeah. always follows with it as well. But it's more than that. It's actually like the the way something is farmed how it's farmed the energy the time put into it is equal to the health of that food which is equal to the health of you so it's so important it's not just you are what you eat you are how your food is taught how it's how it's how it's grown it's it it really is that that powerful definitely there's i think there's nothing more true than that old saying you are what you eat you know and it is it is so true you are what you eat um, it's it's really it's always really alien to me to be honest how our priorities have become a bit skewed you know so we deliver all over you know you see you see new new houses going up being advertised for half a million yeah. pound and and pcp cars on drives with private number plates and yeah. but people will then say that the organic food is too expensive yeah but to me, it's... Well, we haven't got enough land to rear animals in this way. Yeah. When I, I, I got a bus here and went past a huge bingo hall, which uh, hosts thousands <laughs> of people. And it's like, oh, that's a great spot. Like, there's so much land and it's, th- it, there's no excuse for it. It's like, no. well, there's so many people. It's like, we're imaginative creative creatures. Like, we, there is, there are ways. It's just what are your priorities and that's what are your values. That's what I was just going to say. It's, it comes down to priorities, yeah, and what we value and... Ultimately, it's it, it it just it's it, it makes no sense to me to be prioritizing something which doesn't sustain us in a healthy way or sustain the planet in a healthy way. So you know, I share. I mean, Mike and I still drive a diesel vehicle. I, I would love to have an electric van for the for the for the uh, deliveries, but we can't afford one at the minute. You know, we just we did look at it again more recently, but at the minute. Unfortunately, we wouldn't quite be getting the mileage we would need out of it, out of the electric vans. Um, so we do still, we still drive a diesel vehicle, um, but we share one van between us and we like organise our life around that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we try and live low Im- impact as much as we can. Um, I'm not bothered about stuff like buying loads of new clothes and stuff yeah. like that. I buy basics and you'll, you, you tr- yeah, of course, everybody treats yourself to things, but... We can like research options, you know. There's loads of um, loads of even, well, whether it be clothes or whatever, out there now that are uh, trying to kind of make more sustainable options yeah. easier. So Rapa Nui, for example, they are doing all, all organic cotton t-shirts and stuff like that, which they it's always been a pretty sustainable brand. You've got a QR code inside the label. You scan that and you send it back when you're done with it and then it's recycled into more clothes. So, and 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 it's not breaking the, a huge budget, you know, I wouldn't have said. So it's like how we kind of like look at our priorities and say, do we just go and buy the cheap cotton t-shirts and not think about where the cotton's come from or do we just 
search out an option because they are out there um that is more sustainable so it's it, it's but these things do take time i yeah. suppose which is i think when the electric uh van lifers when when electric vans come into the play that'll be a game changer oh when be we amazing. can have camper vans that are electric oh it'll be <laughs> no so one will good be living in homes <laughs> so good because at the minute i don't trust the government enough to uh have electric cars though mm. how is it going to be leveraged <laughs> yeah well yeah uh, yeah i mean at the minute i mean to get an electric van to do what we need it to do would be is a quite a big ask it's yeah. still electric vans are a bit behind cars as well really so sure. there's a there's a there's a there is a bit of a way to go it's a fun Anyway, it's a paradox because we what we know what we know yet we're driving around these vehicles which is killing the planet so we're like uh, it's just like inherent guilt that's like involved in the process and god it's it's quite a fight or flight motion anyway being in a vehicle you're very stimulated but then <laughs> having this knowledge of like gas is being bumped out here yeah. and it's just like well it's like everything i think it's like <laughs> you know we we <laughs> we say it all the time like why are we still selling plastic toothbrushes mm. Wh why haven't we just made all food packaging compostable because it's all out there so why haven't we just done it and that's uh, there's things like that that i can't and i know there's ways of doing things and policies and but sometimes i just think there's so much red tape around everything it would just be easier to just be like right as of i don't know the 31st of August, we no longer sell <laughs> plastic toothbrushes. Everybody has to stock a bamboo one or a degradable one. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. It could be done, but... The, the, the plastic bin bag situation, which 10p a bag, 5p a bag, I mean, most places won't charge you even if you, you, have, you haven't got your reusable bags. Mm. But that, it's like, that, what is that really... Why done? don't we just stop producing the plastic bags? 100%. <laughs> Cups. cups cups plastic I know. cups well, everyone should have a cup if if <laughs> if we if we i mean we just take our cups everywhere they're in the van water with bottles us. mainly yeah water bottles i mean there's so many things but if we just stopped putting them out there we would all have to change our habits because if you couldn't get a coffee because you didn't have a cup it would only take you a couple of times before you were like i'm going to take my cup this morning yeah. <laughs> and it's quite simplistic really when you think about it isn't it yeah but it for is. some reason um i mean i've seen huge differences this year up near where our caravan is in northumberland all of the cafes and everywhere are using compostable it's brilliant um do they have to be disposed of in the right way though they're all just going in seemingly into the because, general bins by the because there's of it. yeah i think and they there's a, such a confusion which isn't helped by zero information about how mm. to recycle things correctly which i i just think is bewildering yeah definitely um, but the fact that is something going to be recycled if it's got residue on like my you know peanut butter plastic or glass containers i'm making sure i've got all that peanut butter out and then i'm recycling it that the takes same, time yeah. it's like am yeah. i doing that is it futile like where's the information like how can i find out more about how to recycle correctly it just isn't there no it isn't and uh yeah it should be like i, I can't believe we're still really not producing that information mm -hmm. i mean north we live in northumberland um well at the minute we're back at my parents which is gated but out the house we sold and the house we're buying is is classed as Northumberland and the recycling is actually really limited in Northumberland so we actually wash everything at the point we have different clip top storage boxes this is mine and Mike's system we put into our council bin what we can and then we if we're going through Hexham for example we'll take all the glass to the glass bottle recycling in Hexham but like you say, that takes time. Why aren't we making it easier yeah. <laughs> for like, everyone? There's um in, in London and other counties, there's food waste bins, which uh, there's a fox situation in London, yeah. which probably, you know, causes a lot of mess at the same time. But and th there was it was proven it was a scheme in Canada that um one of the one of the boroughs or whatever put into this put loads of money into getting the food waste together and putting it into like a, a really sustainable landfill area and they, they use that to put out there to fertilize the soil the land and it really worked well and there's like clear evidence of this really this scheme put into good use saved them a lot of money and they even sold some of it to other neighboring countries and stuff it's like things like that that we don't just implement anyway we're pleasure seeking monkeys <laughs> <laughs> well i think you've kind of managed to link it back to the point you made very early on about um being creative isn't it it's about yeah. being creative yeah, with what you do with that 
kind Limit, of limiting beliefs to really the power and the potential that you have to be creative and do something in a way and influence change to be, you know your friends and community forget giving money it's your friends and community that we need to be talking to and having these Definitely. conversations with and it's so important to speak up to speak to people you meet on the street and just start having conversations about it all um, but this conversation has been going on for about 30 years now mm. uh, everyone's seen the documentaries people don't want to see the documentaries because they know what the documentaries are about so it's like we, this isn't this podcast isn't going to shock anyone it's like we do know this stuff but what's going to take us to stop and think and just change our habits are what we were talking about before the podcast, our what's familiar, mm. the generational game. Yes, I can see that working. Young generations are really being educated about this mm. stuff slowly. But, our, you know, I looked at my parents and lots of my parents, friends, friends, they, they haven't got a clue about this stuff. They're mm. in their habits. They're set in their ways. And it, we can't just wait for the generations to, to kind of pass through. It's easy to stick to familiar, isn't it? Um, and it's harder to push yourself to something unfamiliar. Um, and no doubt, I can't remember that feeling now, but no doubt when I first used a composting toilet or I first composted, that was probably very unfamiliar and unusual. Mm-hmm. But now it's just second nature. So it's, it, it yeah, it can, it can be done. But like you say, we haven't really got the time now to wait for, to put it on to the young people and say it's their problem the next generation or whatever like we all need to make these changes whatever age groups we are and whatever small changes we can make I think I do believe you know it makes a big difference it it doesn't need every one of us being perfect and doing everything it just needs lots of us trying our very best to make some changes Mm -hmm. and I think that can make a big difference but I do what you said there you know about the local I think that's the most important level to focus on because I I don't think that the, the change is really going to come from a governmental level. Yeah, I think. Think global, act local. Yeah, yeah. I think because those little actions that you make on your local level are having an impact long term globally. Yeah. Um, but I don't think we can rely on governments to to make those changes for us. I think um, we have to because it comes back to what we just said before. Like if if why couldn't we just ban? plastic toothbrushes it's yeah it's not it's yeah if we could it would have been done so therefore we have to change the system from the bottom up as consumers by influencing it with our choices yeah which can happen it has proven to be um it's proven to happen in the in the past but yeah it's uh hopefully this podcast will get some hits (laughs) (laughs) but yeah where, where do you see the future of kind of agriculture in the uk it's a big question it is a big question um I hope, I hope that, and I I have seen a big change and I hope that people are going to continue to look at their local options, whether that be their farm shop or their greengrocer, whether it be, because even uh, whether it's organic or not, you know, even if you just go into your local greengrocer and you're not buying organic, but you're buying more locally, then that's a, 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 a huge improvement on buying from wherever in the world um wrapped in plastic from a supermarket shelf you know so mm-hmm. um i hope that people especially post pandemic are going to have seen the impact that of our lifestyles on um on the environment and on on the way we live and feed ourselves and i hope that's going to encourage more people to turn to a local agricultural project whether it be a box scheme or a community grown crop share or whatever it is um i think that with all of the kind of there's some huge issues that have happened isn't there in the last year but obviously brexit is undoubtedly going to change the subsidy system for farming and some of the relationships i guess that we've had in a good way i don't know yet i really don't know um, because it scares the life out of me, trade deals with America, <laughs> so when it comes to food especially, yeah. that's that's scary. Um, I, I, I'm confused by wanting to open up trade deals on a more global scale um, with the likes of America who don't have seemingly the same kind of um controls that we have in the uk when it comes to farming even organic farming you know um, and i'm confused by wanting to open up open everything up more globally when yes we're not going to grow everything in the uk and the paddock sells things that aren't all grown in the uk but we can source that from predominantly 
Europe. Yeah, neighbouring countries. Yeah, neighbouring <laughs> countries. Why do we then want to go more global? That feels like that feels like a step back rather than a step forward. Um, I I really don't know how how that's going to play out. Um, I would hope though that other people would be conscious enough to be doing a bit of research in it especially post pandemic and you know look at educating themselves a little bit and looking at their food choices yeah and i do think that the pandemic did push people to support local more because what the small local shops had were the things people couldn't get in the supermarkets you know we it was more limited but we still had the flour and the pasta and the you know and the things that the toilet rolls <laughs> the things that people couldn't get so i think it did encourage people to shop more locally and i think people were less willing to go into a supermarket they didn't want to be around as many people so lots of people looked to their local shops um and their local food producers and stuff so i would hope that that trend would continue mm -hmm. um whether or not it does once we all kind of go back to normal everyday today life i don't i don't know so it's hard to say where you see agriculture going but my hope for it would be that it would be more local and that we would continue to see the growth in the organic market that we will have been seeing um obviously la this last year any trends are yet to be seen as to whether they're long-term changes or were they predominantly fueled by and a result of the pandemic yeah. and do, do we go back to what was the norm i, I don't know yeah what i would say is if, if people well the the, the, the fundamental thing you can do for your immune system is to change the, the, the health of your food and what you're consuming mm. to strengthen your immune Definitely. system that's the it's, a, it's the biggest thing you can do for yourself now if people are perhaps worried about catching the virus and they haven't looked at their general lifestyle what they're mm. eating their movement their sleep their just patterns of daily habits um and what they're doing day to day if they're not looking at that but you're, you're worried about a virus then something's not quite right there yeah. because surely now the biggest thing we should be looking at is how to strengthen our immune system Definitely. because you know we've wh whatever you believe there's a virus out there and it's making people ill so yeah. let's strengthen our immune systems by eating better food um you know there's, there's other things you can be doing but let's just generally though what you're putting in is the best medicine that you can get and you know we uh, as a family have all worked all the way through this last 18 months and touch wood none of us have succumbed to the virus um steve unfortunately has been the only member of staff to get it and that was as a result of his 13 year old stepdaughter bringing it back from school after um christmas when they spent Christmas together, you know, so he did have have a couple, have to have some time off, and he did get it. But otherwise, the the rest of the the staff have been well as well all the way through. We've been very lucky. But a big part of that, I do believe, probably comes from what we've been, you know, eating and absolutely. And um, and who knows, you may have had something. We carry viruses all the time. We are made up of bad, good bacteria. What we label as morally bad, but it's all one thing. It's like yeah. the com feeds into the conversation about antibiotics and, and all of that in biodiversity because there is no good or bad it is one thing and we need both mm -hmm. to kind of c <laughs> exist with it and it helps us strengthen our immune system by exposing ourselves to these things but we could have had it we could have passed it on we just don't know there's so much we don't know about it uh and and yeah i think coming from that what we don't know is is probably you know the best the best kind of open mindset about it but yeah any do you want to i think yeah i think vaccines and everything you know are like uh like we can't rely on all of that i suppose is what i'm trying to say to kind of well it's we, in my mind we've it's got to you know whether we, you, you believe that getting it for yourself is right or, or, wrong, or wrong it's yeah. another quick fix really yeah. for you know bigger other. issues like and and you know the the pandemic has been linked back already to bigger issues around what we're eating and how it started and you know whatever you believe or don't believe and and the, the global kind of climate change situation they are connected and we can't get away from that and this pandemic is just the, the start it's just one in many situations that are going to occur as a result mm -hmm. of the way we are living and how we're yeah. working with the environment and actually being quite destructive and 
how we're feeding ourselves and stuff. So it really is all, it's it's going back to that thing about ecosystems and connections and it is all very interconnected. Yeah, um, and that's beautifully well put. But I think it's, it's an even bigger conversation about genetically modifying mm. life. You know, we've been genetically modifying food for 30, 50 years and now we're doing it to ourselves mm -hmm. with this different type of vaccine. And we just don't know, well, we, we know what we see, but the further we get away from what's normal, what's natural, the the the, the the iller, the more disease, the more, the more kind of uh, pathologies that are and there will become. So it's like genetically modifying things. We've realized that with food, it's perhaps not the most healthy thing to do. So, mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, we shouldn't need the vaccine to keep us healthy if we were living, you know, in a more natural state to begin with and feeding ourselves right and getting nutrition right and health and well-being and things right. Um but the vaccine's been created, as you say, like a response. Oh, sorry, I put that on. I did put that on silent. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I know. I know what you mean. I guess for health, let's say for healthy and young people, and people don't. Because if you know, if my if, if if I haven't got any grandparents, then they're not around anymore. But mm. if they if they did, I wouldn't be opposed to. You know, anyone's right to choose something that comes out and is presented as a, a, an option to to f fight up against something like this then then great do that for you but i'm not saying what you can't do but then don't no, say no. what i can do no no and i mean I, I, i've opted to take the vaccine i okay. have taken the vaccine i actually just had my second jab last night okay. <laughs> actually and uh my cars and my brother has and um my mom and dad have and my grandma has i have an 85 year old grandma i've got parents i work with on a daily basis who are in their 60s um it's like you've just said, it's choosing what you think is right for your situation. I feel I have a level of social responsibility running a community shop. We have a huge cross section of um of of um customers who are of all different ages, you know. Um was I in a different situation, maybe I would have chosen not to have it. Sure. Because maybe I like, align with maybe a more natural way. I don't think I took it from me because I haven't this whole time through the whole of the last year and a half felt I've been protecting myself as such with anything and um, whether it be a mask or I think I've done it for other people and um, if you know we we felt we should do that to to kind of yeah help protect I suppose family customers yeah. um so so yeah we have we've done it we've taken it um and I, like you just said I don't think there's any right or wrong in this it's it's a it's yeah. an it's an assessment of personal situation and what you feel is right at the time um and I think ultimately uh, yeah I'm probably less likely taking it for myself than I am taking it really for yeah for I, th I think people. it's important to talk about it's important to talk about with fellow humans fellow people fellow strangers like people that you don't know just have that conversation but yeah be compassionate about it because firstly saying is black or white as oh i don't believe that's right and no. it's it's another it's another situation where it's us versus them yeah, and, and it's like well people are asleep people are awake it's like you know we can't wake you it's like us versus them is never going to work we no. are all in it whether you like it or not together absolutely and i think it's really important because we do get kind of quite i suppose media and stuff helps to perpetuate that us versus them it kind of narrative. yeah that, that that narrative and it's really important like to just try and remember that you know ultimately we are all different like we're all going to make different decisions with different people we've got different political views we've got different ideas about how the world should be governed we've got different ideas about how we should live our life and i don't want anything that we've kind of said on the podcast today it sound as though we're being preachy about a kind of more superior way of living yeah, it's sure. just a belief that system that we have that we've decided to come together and talk about today um and 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 because i believe in it so strongly and i'm sure you know you do as well then yeah you are enthusiastic and passionate about it and you feel it's right but i'm quite equally as happy for someone to challenge me on it and uh, there's daily conversations that happen you know um and it's important to listen to people and to take on board maybe what they feel and you know i wouldn't go i would never go to anybody and say like oh well, you're wrong because you're not eating organic or or you're wrong for doing this or you're wrong because you haven't taken the vaccine or um you know it, there's the the world's become quite <laughs> it's become very kind of 
um, oppressive, I think, sometimes, especially with the media, uh, with this us versus them, wrong versus right kind of. And I, I don't think you can live your life like that. I think you need to have your ears open all the time and be constantly listening to people um, and constantly able to challenge yourself and make yourself feel uncomfortable. Um, because who would have known like 18 months ago that we would even I thought I was done with vaccinations <laughs> I didn't think I was gonna have to go who would have thought we'd be talking about all the things we've talked about the last year and a half you know um but but we we've had to and that's made us all feel uncomfortable um so yeah that I think there's no right or wrong um with with any of it and and the vaccine especially I think you've just got to assess what you think you kind of feel you should do at that time yeah sure yeah. i think that's that's well put and uh it's great to to finish on that point god knows how long we've been chatting I away know, now. But hopefully people have stayed <laughs> tuned while. to hear you say you know i'm not preaching here <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> well, that, was, that was truth and integrity and yeah i might put that clip at the, at the start just so <laughs> people stay tuned <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i think it's it's yeah yeah we're 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 talking about something that we believe in and that sure. we feel passionate in. Yeah, and, passionately. Absolutely. Um, we want that to come across, but we're, you know, we don't want to come across that way saying yeah, you know, all knowing all powerful oh, yeah. Jesus, follow me to the your you know, the light. It's it's not it's not how it works. No. Yeah. No, no, life doesn't work that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. You've got to kinda yeah, just try I think the uh, sort of motto I live my life by is just to try and do my best. Um and yeah, I just feel like I'm doing my bit and and try not to impose that on other people. But if um, if other people want to kind of be part of it, then yeah, they're welcome. The shop's there, the veg box scheme's there. You know, <laughs> we'll we'll still be there. We'll have conversations as we do every day with people um, about what they want or you know they believe in, and hopefully that helps to provide something back to the local community where I grew up. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Do you want to point any people with your social media or any? Um. Yeah. Well, we have uh, have the Instagrams at the paddock underscore zero way shop. Um. Obviously, there's Facebook. Just search the paddock. Um. The website is the paddock dot org dot uk. The shop's based in High Spen. Um. Any thirty nine two E L. Um. So yeah, you can look us up and come say hi anytime. Shop opens Wednesday and Thursday ten till five. Friday ten till half four. Saturday ten till three. Um, and currently the box scheme is open to, to everyone, whether it's drop sites or, or delivery. So you can find out all about that on the website, which is thepaddock.org.uk. Beautiful. Thank you, Laura. Thank this you. Has been, this has been lovely. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you for Appreci having me. Appreciate your time and uh, yeah, all your words. Yeah. It's been great. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Cheers. <laughs>